What you're about to listen to is an effect called vibrato. It takes a note and wiggles its pitch up and down. Here's a normal note for comparison. And here's the vibrato again. Vibrato has two key components, frequency, how fast it wiggles, and magnitude, how much the pitch changes. We'll now listen to a note that starts with no vibrato, but slowly adds vibrato back. Listen carefully, something very interesting happens. Did you catch it? The single note sounds like it splits into many. Here's the end of the note again. How is this happening? In this video, we'll explore the surprising science behind this effect and what it has to do with everything ranging from celestial orbits to quantum mechanics. Sound is the vibration of air molecules. Physically, we're able to detect this vibration as waves of pressure. When we play a basic note and measure the pressure, we'll get basic sine waves. To add vibrato, we would want to change the frequency over time, make the sine wave faster here and slower there. So we might consider writing the frequency itself as a sine function. Since generally vibrato is around 6 hertz and has a magnitude around 50 cents, we'll write frequency as such. This means that every 1 over 12 seconds, our frequency will increase from 440 Hz to 452. Then after another 1 over 12 seconds, our frequency will decrease down to 428. However, if we actually apply this transformation, we see something rather unexpected. The frequency continually increases and only continues to increase. To understand what's happening here, let's consider what varying our frequency is actually doing. Our vibrato model switches from a sinusoid of one frequency to another of a slightly different frequency. Here I show the frequencies at time 0.99 seconds and 1 second. They start very close, but as we go along the axis, they separate. When we went from one sine wave to the next, we weren't actually smoothly transitioning, but instead jumping from curve to curve. Thus, frequency continually increases instead of wiggling up and down as we expect. Luckily, we can fix this by adding a phase ourselves such that it connects smoothly. It turns out that the expression for the sine wave with vibrato is the sine of frequencies integral. The exact derivation is left as an exercise to the viewer, but it's a really neat problem so I highly recommend trying it out. Anyhow, our sinusoid for vibrato ends up taking this form, which if we now graph and listen to, gives us what we expected. With a working simulation of vibrato, we're one step closer to understanding why vibrato creates multiple notes. We'll now listen to a few vibrato notes of different frequencies. By doing so, we might better understand the factors at play. We'll start with vibrato frequency of 50. Those of you with perfect pitch might hear a G and a B. Here's another note with vibrato frequency 87. Now you might hear a F and a C. At 212 hertz, you might hear an E and a C sharp. Looking at the frequencies of these notes, we see a pattern might be emerging. The notes seem to be a frequency of vibrato away from the main note. For example, one of the secondary notes in trial 2, 350Hz, is just about equal to the central frequency, 440Hz, minus the frequency of vibrato 87Hz. This, of course, is just an empirical observation, and to confirm this, we'll need to help with the Fourier series. The Fourier series is an approximation of a curve in terms of sine and cosine waves. This breaking down of a wave into sine and cosines, and therefore frequencies, is significant to the context of vibrato because it can pinpoint what notes are present. Therefore, it will help us either prove or disprove our experimentally determined pattern. The Fourier transform will also lead us to bezel functions, which are key to planetary motion and quantum probabilities. But first, let's explore the Fourier transform. We'll start with this sine wave. As we continue to add sine waves to different frequencies, you can see the curve begins to take the shape of a square. It turns out that for every curve, there is a unique combination of sine and cosine waves that describes it. How might we determine what sines describe a function? 
Well, let's take a look at what happens when we multiply a curve by sine waves of increasing frequencies. The blue curve is the original signal, the purple is the sine wave we're multiplying by, and the orange is the result. I've also drawn a red dotted line here to indicate where the average of the resulting signal is. Notice how the red line remains generally close to the axis, except when we multiply by a sine wave of a very specific frequency. That's because when the audio contains the frequency we multiply by, then it has the effect of squaring the signal. And since squares are always positive, the average rises above the axis. But if the audio doesn't contain the frequency, then it will produce the effect of randomly changing the original audio, which keeps the mean near zero. Now plotting the frequencies on the x-axis and the value of the mean on the y-axis, we get a plot that clearly indicates what frequencies are present in our audio. Remember, our ultimate goal is to find the extra notes that are present in our vibrato, and the Fourier transform would tell us exactly that. Now, what I showed you isn't the full picture of the Fourier transform. We also could have multiplied by a cosine wave, which is the animation shown here. So why did we initially choose the sine wave? Well, the truth is there wasn't any big difference between picking the two. Cosine would have been a better choice if our graph was shifted to the left, and sine if it were shifted a bit to the right. The real trick comes from using both of them at the same time. With this, you'll be able to tell how much of each frequency is present and the phase shift. An even cooler trick is to multiply by complex exponentials, but this is actually the same as multiplying by sine or cosine because of Euler's identity. 3blue1brown gives a really nice proof of this with vectors, and I'll link his video in the description. Now here's the actual formula for the Fourier transform. Looks complicated, right? But it's actually just describing the process we did. First, we take the signal and multiply by sine and cosine waves, then we simply take the average. Only in the Fourier transform, we ignore the constant in front, so that if the frequency persists longer, it appears stronger in the frequency plot. Now imagine we want to go from this Fourier transform back to our original signal. Well, since the Fourier transform tells us how much of each frequency is present, we'll just multiply it with all the possible sine waves. Again, this E notation just means multiply by both sine and cosine. This approximation of a signal in terms of sines and cosines is called the Fourier series. Before we jump back into the math, let's listen again to the vibrato to contextualize what we've done so far. Remember, the ultimate goal is to understand exactly where the harmonics are generated and why. We're very close to that goal. The Fourier transform will tell us exactly how much of each frequency is present, so that when we go to calculate it and graph it, we should expect spikes exactly where the extra notes are. Our other goal of connecting astro and quantum physics with music may seem very far off, but I promise the Fourier transform will soon make the connection obvious. We'll start by writing our vibrato expression as a complex exponential. Remember that Euler's identity tells us that sine is just the imaginary part of the exponential. Now we're called Fourier's transform. For now, we'll only consider the coefficient and we'll add the summation back at the end. Substituting our vibrato expression for f of t, we get this and now we rearrange. To continue, we rewrite e to the sine term as its own Fourier transform. This will help simplify the annoying sine part. Now we can rearrange further. It's actually a well-known trick that this integral is always zero unless if the exponent itself is zero, then it will equal two pi. Thus, we'll rewrite this as a piecewise function, and this lets us simplify the whole integral. Now, adding back the summation, we have this expression. But because for every k, there's exactly one n that satisfies the condition, we can cancel the summation to have this final expression as our Fourier series. Plugging in some numbers, we can see we get spikes at exactly where we experimentally predicted earlier. Our experiment determined 350 Hz. Plugging in k equals negative 1, we get 353, which is very close. Plugging in k equals positive 1, we get 527, very close to 525 from our experiment. Usually we do experiments to confirm our theories, but in this case, our theory confirmed our experiment. Now, at the beginning of the video, I promised there's a relation to astronomy and quantum mechanics. Here's what it is. It turns out that constant in front here is solved by something known as the Bessel function. If we actually went and solved for these constants, we would have seen that they're equivalent to this integral. Here's where it gets really interesting. Bessel functions are also the solution to Kepler's equation, which is astronomy, and to solve the electron distribution probabilities, quantum mechanics, as well as a whole host of other fields listed here. Why does the Bessel function appear in these totally unrelated fields? How is music possibly connected to astronomy and possibly connected to quantum mechanics? Let's first take a look at Kepler's equation. This is an equation to describe the position of the planet rotating in ellipse to the time that has elapsed since the start of the orbit. The E here stands for eccentric anomaly. 
It's simply the angle from the center of the ellipse to the planet. The m is known as the mean anomaly. Assume the planet was instead in a constant circular motion of the same period. Given the planet has orbited for time t on the ellipse, where would it now be on the circular orbit? Draw an angle between this point and the center of the ellipse, and that's the mean anomaly. The small e in this equation is the eccentricity of the circle, which is simply given by the length of the minor, or the shorter axis, over the length of the longer, or the major axis. Through some basic geometry, it can be proven that these quantities are related by Kepler's equation. Since m will be a function of time and e one of position, we can then solve for the position of the planet in terms of time. Perhaps this relation is easier seen if we change the name of the variables. We'll call mt because it's related to time, and ex of t because it's related to position. This substitution also brings out the fact that t is our input and x of t is our output. Now look at the equation again. It's not easy to separate the variables, and it's not trivially solved. This is what's known as a transcendental equation. To solve this, Frederick Bessel made use of the Fourier transform. Notice this sign term here. It's really annoying that it's written in terms of x of t. Fortunately, there's something we already learned about in this very video that can convert it to a function of t. That's the Fourier series representation. To simplify, we'll rearrange, and like last time, we'll ignore the summation for now. We might see we can proceed here with integral by parts. Oftentimes, when we do integral by parts, we'll find that we can apply integral by parts again on the new integral. Now, recalling our original equation and substituting t with x of t, we have this, which simplifies to this integral. You might notice this is very similar to Basel's first integral, the one we got from Fourier transform of our vibrato. It's not a coincidence at all that the Bessel function appears as a solution in both problems of orbits and vibrato. Consider a different solution to Kepler's equation. We'll take a guess at x of t in terms of t. Then we'll continue to refine our guess. We'll start with x of t equals t. We can see this differs by e sine of t, so we'll add that to our guess. But now to continue guessing, it gets a little confusing. This is where we'll need the Taylor series. Just like how our Fourier series was sine and cosine representation of a curve, the Taylor series is a polynomial representation. Here, I show how you can sum some basic polynomials to get a curve that almost exactly matches the cosine one. You also may notice small angle approximations, which are just the first few terms of the Taylor series. Cosine of x equals 1 minus x squared, and sine of x equals x, which hold for small values of x. To make our prediction with the Taylor series, we might consider a few properties of the original curve and make sure the approximation also has these properties. For example, if the original curve has the point 0, 1, then our new curve should probably contain the point 0, 1, 2. If the slope of our curve is 1 at x equals 0, then the slope of the new curve should also be 1. In general, if the nth derivative is m, then the nth derivative of our approximation should also be m. Now here's a general formula for the Taylor series. It looks much more complicated, but it's just doing the derivative matching process we described. When we take the 0th derivative, we get f of 0 equals f of 0. And when we take the first derivative, we get f prime of 0 equals f prime of 0. So the slope of the function matches. Now, these factorials may look scary, but they really just emerge naturally to cancel out the extra factors of multiplication from the power rule. Because of notation, you might sometimes see Taylor series written in a weird form like this. It might be weird to see the Taylor series of natural log of x still include some ln terms, but notice on the right side, the natural logs are all just representing the derivatives. So now to continue guessing with Kepler's equation, we'll just consider the first two terms of the Taylor series. Then we can substitute our guess into the series and substitute the series itself to find that our correction should be e squared over 2 sine of 2t. As we keep making these substitutions, we can see that x of t can be completely written in terms of sine of t terms. Recall that when using Bessel's method to solve Kepler's equation, we take the Fourier transform of sine of x of t. But since x of t can be written in terms of sine of t's, we were really just taking the Fourier transform of sine of sine of t's. That was the same fundamental question we solved when finding harmonics of vibrato. Perhaps another way to think about this is looking at the orbit itself. We can see that near the perihelion, the point closest to the sun, our planet moves fast, and at the aphelion, the point furthest from the sun, our planet moves slow. You might know that the position of the planet relative to the sun can be expressed in polar coordinates as such. 
But since we have this speeding up near the sun and slowing down far away, we might imagine theta being written in terms of sines. Here again, we get the cosine and sine of term that was also in our vibrato. To explain how electron distributions and quantum mechanics relate to vibrato, we'll first take a look at a slightly different problem. How does the surface of a drum vibrate? The equation for this vibration was first described by Euler and is known as the wave equation. Intuitively, the left side of this equation corresponds to the restoring force, and the right side corresponds to a 3D sort of second derivative. Essentially, this equation tells us that the more a surface is curved, the more it tries to return to its original shape, which makes sense. Instead of x and y, we'll convert to polar coordinates, for this, and for the sake of simplicity, we'll simplify to the symmetrical case so that we can ignore theta. But know that even if we considered it, the solution would be similar. Assuming u can be written as r times t, because r and t are independent, we have this. And since both sides are purely in terms of r or t, they must be equivalent to some constant k. Finally, using the Taylor series, it can be shown that the solution is once again the bezel function. Here's a visualization of what those vibrations look like. These vibrations are closely related to quantum mechanics as the wave equation also solves the probability of electron distribution in an atom. Just as how every point on the drum corresponds to how other points around it are vibrating, the electron responds to where other electrons in the atom are. As proof of their similarity, here's a side-by-side -side comparison of some vibration modes in a drum to the electron probability distributions. They are exactly the same. It's a bit more difficult to understand why the question of vibrations is related to Fourier transform of sine of sine of x. Even though our equation looks similar, note the key difference that the drum vibration only invokes bezel functions of zero order. It feels like these problems should be connected somehow. Orbits are like a circular form of oscillation, and if you really focus on one point of the jump, it even looks like there's some sine of sine of stuff going on. It's really unsatisfying to leave it as just a coincidence, but I couldn't figure out the connection. So if you know or can think of an intuitive reason as to why these problems are connected, please comment down below. So, today we started with the simple question, why does a high-frequency vibrato seem to create multiple notes? And to answer that question, we encountered Fourier analysis and Bessel functions, which are of paramount importance to many engineers. But if you take away anything from today, the most important thing is not that we learned these formulas or algorithms, but that we found ourselves in all sorts of fields that you wouldn't expect to be related in music. You've probably heard the expression before that all stories are the same. Scientists maybe are not all solving the same question, but as we saw today, a lot of science is interconnected, and I think that's one of the things that makes science beautiful. Thanks for watching, please subscribe, and get out of here! Thank you.